Namaste, Richard. Namaste, Adyashanti. Good to be with you again. You as well in your new location? Yeah, I'm in Sri Lanka now. Yes, but you're still, as I can see from your background, under the influence of Arunachala. Wherever I go, I never forget Arunachala. Yes, that's what let us uh, leave India after eight years, is when I finally found that Aeronatula was inside me, then I could be wherever in the world and still with Aeronatula. The grace is there always. Yeah, he's the self. Yes. Pure self. <laughs> So I don't feel any separation. I thought I would, you know. Yes, but I didn't feel. He's present. He's fully present here in me, just like mm -hmm. you explained. Well, I really enjoyed the quotes that you sent me from Bhagavan Nomi. Um, I had passed him by, you know, years ago when I heard about him heard about him the first time uh, because of the name. It, it seemed a bit kind of yuppie, smart ass, you know. <laughs> it might have been, you never know. <laughs> but uh, actually, I, I think your explanation was right on that he was answering Ramana's question, who am I? Yes. I yes. am no me. Yes. And I thought he did it very clearly. It's just that he it came out in some way that some people thought was a cutesy, yippee thing. And I mm -hmm. know other people who have uh, disregarded him because of the name. But now and that I read his writings, it's so clear and right on. Yes. Yes, indeed. And, you know, so what we will talk about this time is a uh, letter that I found from Nomi that he wrote to a uh, woman that uh, helped him find some books. Uh, he his realization was in the 1970s. And at that time in the U.S., a lot of the materials that are available today just were not available. And one of the things he had been trying to find is a copy of the Avaduta Gita. Avaduta Gita, yeah. And uh, he was able to find that copy from this woman who was a yoga teacher who lived on the East Coast of the U.S., and uh, the letter I found, he wrote at about the same age as uh, Ramana was when he uh, scratched out, who am I, the answers to the questions in the dirt in up on the mountain in Thiruvannamalai. Skandashram. And, yes, it wasn't Skandashram, it was Guhat. Guhai Namashivaya, which is near oh. Virupaksha Cave. Gotcha. And it's the temple where he stayed for some time. Uh, he, he stayed there some of the time while he was in the Virupaksha age. The Virupaksha didn't have water year round and mm -hmm. so there were other places that he stayed uh, when the water was dry wow. so let me uh, we had talked about uh, sharing Nomi's writings with your audience and yeah. if I may may I put them on screen yeah I think they're very valuable let's show them and share okay. them and discuss them 
and I thought we'd just uh, go through and read them uh, verse by verse and maybe say something about each as it goes by. Okay. So here we go, hopefully. So this is the beginning of uh, what he wrote. And again, remember, this is from some 21-year-old guy. So, uh, a saint, I, my... A saint in truth is a saint in youth. <laughs> I myself am the truth. There is nothing to be attained Self-realization is being, not being this or that, just being. This is the wisdom of the infinite depth and the realization of all the sages. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's enough. <laughs> that is enough right there to go on for a long time. Yes. Yes. And you can see... In uh, that verse, the basis for his taking the name Nomi. Yeah. Yeah. Once you get past the, you know, the, the image of the name, the, the kind of cutesy image of the name, there's some real substance there. Yes. Yes. And so he continued... I have nothing at which to point. Being cannot be called a thing. These words are spoken from the absolute, of the absolute, to the absolute. There is no person or entity on either side of this letter. The absolute absence of you and me is the absolute presence of I. <laughs> you know, that could have been written by Ramana. Yes. Uh, and also, to me, it seems like it could be found in places like the Ribu Gita. Yes, it's on that same level. Yes, yes. And in that verse, one of the things that I particularly appreciate, that was, uh, was his expression of uh, that the absolute being then uh, includes uh, the seer, the seen, and the seeing. Yes. All in one. Three in one. Yes, yes. And so as he continues, he says, I am this. I am. Existence consciousness, transparent, void, and shining unnameable and inconceivable. I am beyond all words and thoughts, utterly non-objective. I do not admit of this or that, here or there, now or then, within or without, form or formless, knowledge or ignorance, freedom or bondage, life or death, for whom could these apply? <laughs> and I think we had just saw a demonstration of non-duality. He's saying I'm not any of these dual apparent opposites. <laughs> I'm just that. 
Yes, because as soon as you draw a line and make a distinction between this and that, or any dichotomy, yes, you're immediately in duality. Right. You are limiting the self, creating a boundary. And the, then what is what results is not the self, it's something else. Yes, yes. The other. Yes. Well, as soon as you make any difference, any difference anywhere, then you are out of the self. Yeah. Uh, Nomi's uh, wife, uh, Shashwati, is also highly evolved. And while I was doing Seva at the temple once, she said to me, kind of casually in passing, you know, there's no difference between work and play. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of I didn't really understand that to begin with, but uh, now it is absolute clarity. And of course, there's no difference. The only difference between those activities are the difference my mind puts on it. Right. And I feel so fortunate at this stage of my life that even on the psychological platform, there's no difference between work and play. Mm -hmm. Everything I do is enjoyable. Yes. Or I wouldn't yes. do it. Yes. And the, the thing that makes us distinguish work from play is, again, the involvement of the other. Mm -hmm. I'm working for some boss or some corporation mm -hmm. or business or something external to myself. Mm -hmm. And that, that he brings it home when he says in the previous verse that he, the I am is non-objective. Yes. It's not something out there. It's not something any different from me. So in that case, and that collapses all distinctions. Yes, yes. Because whatever one we of the, experience is part of the self. Thank you. Yes. Long. One of the things he would regularly say is make your inquiry non-objective. Hmm. I bet that's tough to hear when you're still in conditioned consciousness. That's right. But at what least it, it gives you an aspirational goal. Uh. You know, and, uh, you know, shows that there is something deeper and shows where to look for it. It's complicated trying to look non-objectively, of course, because the mind uh, can only see things objectively. So as soon as you try to do it, it kind of shorts out the mind. <laughs> I think maybe that's the purpose. I remember that stage because it wasn't that long ago, only uh -huh. about two or three years ago, when I was trying to see the self, you know, yes. as, as something objective. And, you know, I had gone through years of Buddhist meditation and, you know, uh, seeing the light within and all this, you know, and uh, looking for the self in that. But it's not. The self is the seer, not the seeing. Yes. And not the seeing either. Yes. Yes. And uh, I have tried to uh, look at consciousness many times. And the problem with trying to, it's like trying to look at the self. The problem of trying to look at consciousness is everything I see that is sensory and perceptual are all objects of consciousness. And when you look, you see the objects and the consciousness, which is there permeating all of this, is it seems like it's not visible. 
Ah, but it, it is or it can be visible as a reflection. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. For example, the inner light that you see when meditating is the light of the self reflected in the purified mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the yes. purer and, and more mirror-like, you know, the mind becomes, then the reflection is more perfect and brilliant and concentrated. Yes, yes. But you're still not going to find consciousness seen directly in any of the things you look at. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? <laughs> You're it. <laughs> now, uh, one of the things at Guhai Namashivaya, where uh, Ramana scratched out <coughs> the word, is in the uh, cave that the temple is built around this old cave you know usually in a place like that they have something like an altar to use to focus your meditation on and there they have an altar and in the altar there is a mirror oh beautiful <laughs> so that's the highest platform. There's nothing beyond that. That's it. Yes. So let me continue. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was just, I wanted to say something. There's an old photo, which I have somewhere. I'll try to dig it up and put it up on the screen when I edit this. Of Ramana in those days, surrounded by his early, early devotees mm -hmm. and these guys are rough man yes you know, they're all farmers and you know have lived outdoors most of their lives and they're uh, you know if you saw them walking down the street you want to you'd want to go the other way <laughs> you know? but these are actually the kings of self-realization because they were on that platform with ramana Mm -hmm. Maybe they didn't become famous or they didn't become great teachers. But man, they were there. Mm -hmm. Good, I'd love to see the picture. I'm going to try to dig it up. Okay. So here we are continuing with Nomi's. Now, there mm -hmm. is not a single objective thing. Any such thing would depend on a subject, which in turn is another object. But this subject, when sought, is found to be not. This absolute absence of anything and anyone. Boy, that's deep. Yes. And I think that's uh, what we were talking about before, the problem with looking for the subject among the objects. You're not going to find it. No. At best, you're going to find only a dim reflection. Yes. But that's Maya. Mm -hmm. That's the mirage, like the water in the desert. Yes, yes. I think Maya is another word for mind. Absolutely, because it creates all these false dichotomies. Yes. And tries yes. to make what the subject into the object. Mm -hmm. What you else know, can it do? Well, yeah, there's nothing else it can do. Because, you know, like we have this inner conversation. And when you talk to yourself in your mind, you use the word you. Well, you didn't you get up early this morning? Mm -hmm. You know, don't you have to do this or do that? Didn't you think that such and such and so and so, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, it objectifies the self. That's how mind operates. Mm -hmm. And again, I would refer back to Drik Drishya Vivekaha. Mm -hmm. 
that talks about that explains it extensively. And yes. uh, we diagrammed it out and everything in the series. I'll put a link to it here. That uh, the only consciousness in the world is simply a reflection of the self. Just like after a rain, there's so many puddles, you know, yes. and the, the reflection of the moon or sun, whether it's in the ocean, which is vast, or whether it's in the footprint of a calf, which is very small, the reflection is the same. And both are not true. They're not the real thing. They're only a representation, a symbol, an abstraction of the reality. So there's no way to perceive consciousness. This is why the scientists have it so wrong. Yes. Well, they're trying to perceive consciousness as something that is materially produced, and they just can't figure out how it's produced. <laughs> And yet, I they can't, themselves, again, I can't find it anywhere. They themselves are conscious. That's uh -huh. a joke. So here, continuing uh, with these verses. Yeah. Okay. Now, this should amuse some people, I think, to be enlightened or unenlightened is the great liberation and the absolute presence of I. What's this one. guy doing? He's taking away the difference between enlightenment and unenlightenment. Oh my goodness. What am I supposed to think next? <laughs> You're not supposed to think anything. <laughs> oh. <Oof>. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's another distinction. Yes, yes. I, there was a quote from Ramana that I love. He said, to declare oneself to be either enlightened or unenlightened creates broad grounds for ridicule. <laughs> yes. Now, there's also a uh, quote from, I think, the third patriarch of Zen, where he wrote uh, something like making a distinction between good and bad, making a distinction between what you like and what you do not like is the disease of the mind. I love the disease of the mind. <laughs> yeah, the mind is a disease. It's a cancerous yes. growth on the self. <laughs> it's so the here, origin of all our suffering. Yes. Continuing, experience and knowledge are inside. How can their objects be outside? It follows that there is nothing outside. All is within. What is within is myself. Therefore, the experiencer and the experience are one and the same. That is myself. Relatively, I who am nothing am everything. Absolutely, I alone am. Well, that's really reminiscent of Bhagavad Gita. We have to accept our fundamental aloneness to attain and especially to maintain self-realization. Because every time we try to create a relationship. We again we bring up this object of consciousness. Mm -hmm. 
and try to uh, define a relation between self and other. And then the, the absolute, the uh, non-dual is lost. Mm -hmm. Now, this aloneness of which you speak is, I think, the actual experience of many in practice. Uh, I've spent uh, more than 50 years in my own ways trying to sort this stuff out and find my experience. And though I had 15 years of the most marvelous teaching from Nomi, where I know I spent more than a thousand hours with him during those times. So that's enough time even for this stupid mind to start to catch on. But most of my practice has been, of course, alone. How else do you deal with any of this stuff except to try your best to somehow find it? And the only place you can find it is within yourself. And that is an activity that you do by yourself, even if you're in a room with other people. Yes. You know, the Buddha never advised anyone to uh, go join a meditation retreat or a group, some kind of group meditation or something. He always said, and there are at least 200 instances of this in the suttas. He said, go alone to the roots of a tree, to an abandoned building, to the forest, to a field, and do what has to be done. Mm -hmm. This is a stock phrase in the Buddha's lexicon. Okay. Okay. And it's certainly my experience is to do what has to be done is something fundamentally I do by myself alone within myself. My meditation teacher, Bhikkhu Nyanananda, one time said to me, whatever you have done, you have to undo. <laughs> Uh-oh, my favorite misidentification is in doing. I'm in trouble. <laughs> he then clarified it and said, whatever you have created, you must uncreate. That's me being a creative person, right? An artist. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. I also am a creative, and that is your speaking of a lifetime of trouble ahead for me. Well, he nailed me on that one. Uh huh. I don't know how you unpost videos. Well, it, it, it's not me, you know, it's not about I. Yes. No. Oh, I have all this knowledge, you know, not at all. Yes. Yes. But it's simply the creation of a context or the, you know, bringing up mm -hmm. a background. Yes. Against yes. which then these type of statements like Nomi is making here make sense. Yes. Yes. And when you have the right background, when you have the right context, it is perfectly clear. Uh -huh. And otherwise, it's just a bunch of strange words. <laughs> How can somebody say that? I must be, it must have took too much LSD or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was a cartoon like about that. Back, <laughs> all back in the 60s. <laughs> yes. These... Uh, these three guys go into the Poroshki shop on Haight, in Haight-Ashbury. It's a famous hippie place. Uh -huh. And while they're waiting for their Poroshkis, this guy starts saying, you know, there's really, there's no difference between me and anything else. And actually, individual existence is just a dream. And, you know, he goes on in this vein, right? Uh -huh. And as he's talking, he starts to become transparent and gradually fade out. 
<laughs> and finally he completely disappears. And the other two guys are looking at this, and one says, dude had a beautiful head, man. <laughs> and the other one says, can I have his Poroshki? <laughs> It's just so existential, you know. <laughs> but yeah, it's true. When we hear that kind of absolute language, we can't digest it. The mind yes. can't can't digest it. Yes. And certainly when I was with Nomi, uh from the beginning, I had some kind of sense that he was telling me the truth and I'd never heard the truth before. I didn't understand what he was saying, but I knew it was true. And because of that, I kept going back. And some years later, I kind of knew what he was saying. <laughs> it took years, decades. You know, I was with him for 15 years and I kind of think that's how long it takes to get started. Yeah. yeah. When I got. And notice I didn't say finish, I said get started. Started, right. Yes. When I got first path in 1984, <clears throat> I didn't have any background in non dual uh, understanding. It happened to me. It was a blessing from the goddess. Uh huh. But it took me another 30. 33 years or something like that to wrap my mind around it, to get this mm -hmm. background that enabled me to at, at least, you know, have a, a map where that experience has a place, you know? Mm -hmm. And again, it's a matter of context. Mm -hmm. Now, Nomi had, uh, Nomi had, uh, this experience, Nerva Kalpa Samadhi, where mm -hmm. there is only that. And it was when he was a teenager sitting on a bench in a park in New Jersey. And uh, he had not had much religious training. His parents thought that religion was evil. So he... Uh, didn't have something like an uncle coming to tell him about era natural. That was not his experience. And then uh, shortly thereafter, he took money from his mother's purse. Does this sound familiar with Ramana's uh, story? Yes, right. And uh, got a ticket to San Francisco. And in San Francisco, he found a real Swami, someone who was versed in uh, the teachings and the context. And the Swami introduced him to several Upanishads and mm. importantly introduced him to Ramana Maharshi. Ah. And, and he uh, ordered from Ramana Ashram some books. And in those days, then the books would ship by sea from India and took several months to get. And once he got the books, he uh, was completely absorbed in uh, inquiry then until he had the kind of experience that doesn't come and go anymore. Mm -hmm. And... It took me more than a decade with him before he told me his enlightenment story. You know, a lot of these guys are proud of their enlightenment story, and they want to tell you right away. As I say, it took me a decade, and then it only happened when I asked him directly about it. He would answer anything that you ask him, but he just wouldn't volunteer these personal stories. He would say, what good does it do you to hear about someone who doesn't exist? Oh, wow. He's uncompromising, isn't he? Yes. Yes. I love it. And anyway, he said, uh, 
his enlightenment story was he was waiting in the office of an oral surgeon. <laughs> and he was reading some Ramana pamphlet. And, uh, you know, that was enough at the time to uh, take him home, if you will. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I'm sure he never told the story is, you know, how uh, spiritual seekers are. And uh, I can just imagine in San Francisco, a bunch of scruffy, hippie-looking guys going into the oral surgeon's office waiting <laughs> for enlightenment to come. <laughs> but the thing is, it never comes the same way twice. Right. Of course. Anyway. It's hey, I, just... got a, I got a story to tell you. When I got third path, right? Third path is when you realize there's no me. Yes. Okay. And I was on a flight from Norway to Sri Lanka. And we were, uh, I, I was sitting in the, the exit row, you know, in front of this blank mm -hmm. wall. I felt like Bodhidharma, you know, staring at the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and next to me was this uh, Arab family, very nice, educated people. And uh, they had a little baby. And as the plane began its approach into Abu Dhabi, um, the baby began to cry, probably because of the change in cabin pressure. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, pressing on the inner ear, on the eardrum. And, uh, and they were looking at me and, and saying, oh, I'm sorry, it's a disturbance. We can see you're trying to meditate and like this. They're really nice people. And I just said, you know, it's no bother at all. I'll just increase my concentration, right? <laughs> so I did. I made a really strong effort to concentrate, even though there was all this noise, you know, and in the plane and whatever. And boom. I hope you said thank you. I didn't have a chance. I, I couldn't <laughs> speak. Wow. And, you know, when the plane lands, everybody jumps up and runs for the exit. And I was just sitting there. Like, mm -hmm. well, what do I do now? You know? And, of course, I had to get out of the plane eventually. And I found myself, I had like, I don't know, two hours to wait for the connection. Just rattling around Abu Dhabi Airport which if you've ever been there is a gigantic thing, you know, it's mm -hmm. like yes. five times the size of Chennai airport. Um, going in and what am I going to do with myself? You know? So then I saw a sign mosque, airport mosque. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to the mosque and I took off my shoes. I found a cloth in my bag and put it over my head, washed my hands and feet. I went into the mosque, did namaz, and then just sat there against the back wall. Nobody's, nobody even blinked. They were so cool, you know. Mm -hmm. I had a beard, so I guess I was okay. <laughs> <laughs> but in that peaceful space, I was able to begin to integrate this huge insight. You know? And when I yes. got back to Sri Lanka, I was like, my God, what are we going to do? How do I even decide like how to get through the day? There's, you know, there's just nothing there anymore. Yes. So I realized I had to create basically a synthetic personality. <laughs> Seriously, uh -huh. it's a matter yes. of survival because I was living alone. Now, if I right. had been in, a, in an ashram with sufficiently evolved people who could understand what I was going through, then I could have probably gone all the way mm -hmm. um, in a very short time. But because I had to feed myself and, and deal with, you know, being an expat, 
and all, you know, all that stuff. Yes. Uh, I had to, I was forced to basically create a mind. Mm -hmm. Mine was blown, <laughs> thoroughly blown. And so that's, that has continued, you know, to the present day. This is what, mm -hmm. seven years ago. Mm -hmm. This issue with the integration of the experience, you also see if you look at the lives of others of the saints, certainly if Ramana spent 10 years in silence and he was integrating his experience, Nomi spent time in silence also. And I think it was the same thing. He integrated his experience. He uh, came out of the silence as people started to ask him questions. Yeah. Anyway. Is there any more, uh, any more verses? Yes. Yes, there is. I have ah. the next queued up, ready to go. And when inquired when deeply inquired into, ignorance and bondage are seen to be enlightenment and liberation. Why do some people speak of teachings and practices to flee from what has never been? And he goes on to say, you are awareness. Awareness is another name for you. Since you are awareness, there is no need to attain or cultivate it. And this last stanza is from Ramana Maharshi. There's a, a, a conversation in the talks book that yes. appears several times in different places with different people and basically uh, they're asking Ramana how to become enlightened right? and he goes well are you aware mm -hmm. and they go yeah and are you aware that you're aware yeah so he says the self is already realized that's right. What more do you need to do? And if they were sufficiently advanced, that would have been enough. And if they were not sufficiently advanced, they would be, huh? What's that guy yeah, say? Keep on asking more questions and more questions. And he's just going, you didn't get it, did you? <laughs> yes. Yes. So this is the thing. But on the other hand, it cannot be imitated. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like you can just learn the lines and play mm -hmm. the part. Yes. Yes. If you are, all of that is entirely mental. And if you're in one of the mental constructs, uh, that is the problem, not the solution. Exactly. Anyway, I think it was worthwhile to go through this writing of Nomi, and I was pleased to find it somewhere hidden on my computer. I'm going to post that file and link to it from the video description. Oh, good. So people can read it for themselves. Good, good. The uh, woman, the yoga teacher to whom he wrote this letter, by the way, was married and had, she was one of the most influential yoga teachers on the East Coast at that time. And she was happily married in a long-term relationship. And what she did after she got that letter was uh, leave her husband, go to California, to be with Nomi and one of the initial places that he gave satsang was at a house that she had bought in Santa Cruz, California. That's it, how he got to Santa Cruz. It's still there, isn't it? The SRI? Uh, yeah, the, 
the society of abidance and truth is in their own facility now in oh. Santa Cruz. They're not meeting in Shanti's house anymore. And Shanti left her husband again to be with the teacher. She left her husband. She left her successful uh, career as a yoga teacher just so taken with the words of this young Swami that she abandoned her previous life to be closer and to be able to listen. Wow. That's devotion. Mm -hmm. That I mean, is devotion. When I met my Adi Guru, Srila Prabhupada, it took me four years to surrender. Mm -hmm. But when once I did, you know, because I was so attached to being a musician. I mean, mm -hmm. being a musician in, in San Francisco in the 1960s, well, you could just imagine what it was like. <laughs> yes. There are whole years that I don't remember at all. <laughs> but they were good. They must have been. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I used to rent a room in Janis Joplin's house, if that gives you any inclination, indication. But uh -huh. anyway, yeah, I was so attached to it. Um, but circumstances conspired to more or less push me into it and make it necessary for me to just walk away from all that. You know, I, I mean, I still kept up my music, but I became a devotional musician mm -hmm. and a uh, kirtan leader. And so uh, I would travel all over India. I was you know, kept up my studies with Ali Akbar, uh, Kansaho, and uh, became, you know, pretty expert at the pronunciation and the, the rhythm of the Sanskrit and mm -hmm. the uh, traditional melodies, which are very beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I miss that culture, you know. It's too bad they're diehard dualists. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the culture is, is beautiful. And um, so it took me f four years to surrender. But even then, I still had a lot of personal ambition, you know. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until, wow, like, almost 20 years later that I came in contact with the non-dual teaching. Okay. I mean, to, to where I recognized it as a valid teaching. Mm -hmm. I had to actually contact with my Qigong teacher, mm -hmm. whose husband was one of the uh, most famous Chan or Zen meditation mm -hmm. masters. And she would always... Uh, at the end of our Qigong session, she would have us meditate. And mm -hmm. she would go around and give energy, you know. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know what a blessing that was at the time. Mm -hmm. But I think she kind of pushed me in that direction, you know. Mm -hmm. Because I never experienced that anywhere else. That pure energy. She was 84 mm -hmm. years old teaching this room full of young bucks, you know, from martial uh -huh. artists, most of them. And one day she says, ah, I give demonstration, right? <laughs> and she, so she had all of us line up on one side of the room and she was standing on the other side of the room talking to her friend, her, her a lady friend. And she said, okay, now run up, run across the room and jump on me and attack me, one at a time. And we go, are you sure? You know, <laughs> you really want us to do? This? She says, oh yeah. And I said, no problem. Right. So little did we know. So you know, the biggest guy went first, right? Because he's like the leader of the gang, and he couldn't get within ten feet of her. I mean, talk about, you know, the force, right? Yes. She had it. And years later, I came to understand what she was doing was projecting her chi 
into the muscles and uh, causing the body to go out of control. So they were wow. tripping over their own feet, you know, mm -hmm. smashing into walls and stuff like this. <laughs> so, you know, there, there are powers and stuff like that that you could gain through these kind of practices. Mm -hmm. But uh, the real thing is always the mind and consciousness mm -hmm. and coming to the non-dual state. Mm -hmm. And for many, the to get uh, entranced by these powers for many people is to get further absorbed in the ego rather than to release the ego. I had two people who were very close to me, my mother and my brother, who both uh, showed these powers. And uh, I could see there, uh, in the case of my brother, I could see his ego growing. In the case of my mother, her last years, I tried to uh, show her what Ramana had to say, and she could hear it, but she still felt like, I can't let go of my ego. My ego is what got me through all of these difficult days. And that was what she held on to until her death. So uh, powers can be entrancing, but you need to let them go too. And also different kinds of mukti. <laughs> okay. You know, there are five kinds of mukti. And uh, they are basically beginning another cycle of manifestation, maybe on a higher level. Uh, mm -hmm. in some heavenly loka or something like this. But it's, again, taking an identity, becoming an individual, taking a body, being in some world. It may be a much nicer world than this one. But it's still the same problem. Mm -hmm. So why would we want to, you know, play that game all over again? We already know where it leads. Uh-huh. And it's not worth it, you know. Um, to me, <clears throat> I just kind of lost interest. Although mm -hmm. I, I do want to spend the rest of my days trying to help people, whether I can or not. I don't know. Mm -hmm. but at right. least I can try, you know. Of course. <laughs> and if you're offering freely, then it really doesn't matter whether you reach them or not. It's being your freely offering is like the fruit tree in the garden. It just has fruit. It's not like I want to be, you know, bodhisattva and, you know, stick around to the end of the universe uh -huh. uh, helping people. You know, I want out of here. <laughs> but uh, That's while you're here. While I'm here. Let me do some good in the world. That's right. That's right. Anyway, I think we may have done enough good for today. Mia, I think so. And uh, dinner is almost ready. So uh, we have the best food here. Oh, my oh, God. Oh, good. Oh, the lady of the house is a, a real artist. What a cook, you know. I'm thinking maybe we should have the spring workshop here. <laughs> The food would be better. It sure would. You can't get a lot of things in Spain, you know. <laughs> but anyway, we'll see what happens. You know, it's not up to me. Or... Yes. So thank you again, Richard. Every time we do this, it's like it reveals a deeper truth. And I'm so happy, thankful for your association. Because yeah, the way we communicate, it's not like anybody else. Well, again, I'm so pleased that we're able to do this together.
It just fills my heart. So thank you. Om Tatsa. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Ramanaya. Sri Ramanaya.